Welcome, friends, to our online gathering. So glad you could join us from your homes today. As here we are, the last Sunday uh, in April, as spring continues to come around, uh, the birds singing in the air, the buds, the tulips starting to blossom. And uh, I want to begin today by just coming back to what, what I asked us all last week, and that is, what gets you and I excited? You know, we, we talked last week, we mentioned sporting events and, of course, celebrating Easter Sunday, the wonderful story of Jesus uh, coming to life again, uh, the wonderful uh, freedom that you and I have in what Jesus has done for us. So as we transition from Matthew's writings to Mark's writings, I want to read for you Mark's opening statements. He says, this is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. This is where Mark begins his adventure of telling the story of Jesus. And so maybe to, to start there today, let me ask you again, what gets you excited? When you think about what's happening in here, in your heart, in your soul, maybe with, with the turmoil that's around us, maybe with some of the hurt and some of the confusion that you're dealing with. And I know that those are words that you have shared with me as we have had conversations uh, together. Even this past week, as you think about, as you reflect on that hurt and confusion that seems to be all around you, let me rephrase that question another way. Is there's something or someone that still gets you excited. And friends, I believe that's the incredible journey that we're going to embark on here as we start to look at Mark's writings together. This is the good news of Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. So again, thank you for joining us today. Would you take a moment and pray with me? God, our Father, we acknowledge once again your presence in our homes today. Have your way. Help us to quiet our, our minds, our hearts from all that's going around us. The hurt, the, the confusion, um, the discontentment, the worry. God, may we in these few moments together today through the wonder of you, the mystery of your spirit, set that aside and come before you to experience your love. May it bring us life today. As we look ahead to the spring, to the sun, to the summer, to the life that will bud around us, God, make it so even in our hearts today as we share in this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Bring forth.
For the past uh, eight years, we have seen uh, God at work in Lebanon through the local church, specifically after the refugees, the Syrian refugees crisis due to the civil war in Syria. Uh, we have seen the church in Lebanon step out and uh, go the extra mile to support uh, the refugees in Lebanon through medical assistance, food assistance, or any kind of assistance they can present. Uh, the church in Lebanon has also been supporting uh, the most needy families in Lebanon since the start of the economic crisis in 2019. Um, we can see uh, the amazing work also uh, done in the Middle East through the local churches in Egypt, in Sudan, specifically after the economic crisis and the political crisis hit the country, the church has stepped out and uh, been playing uh, the role of uh, agent of peace in their communities, also supporting the needy families that have uh, uh, lost either their jobs or their income due to the economic crisis. We have seen the amazing work that the church in Syria has been doing for the past few years, supporting displaced people. And now with the efforts of rebuilding, uh, the church in Syria is doing an amazing work, supporting the families that have lost their homes and rebuilding their homes to be able to relocate. Um, the, not only the local church in our area, but we can see also the work done by the global church, supporting the local churches in the MENA region. We are thankful for the amazing work that's been uh, done and we are thankful for God's work in our region. When the media draws our attention to the broken part of this world, the truth of the word of God is drawing us back to focus on God and his word. Peace is not about how we feel. It belongs to God's character. So whenever I meditate on God's words, I experience God's peace. Even the unrest situation out there is still keep happening. But I can always see God's peace through his work and the message he passed to us. Besides, I also see God's peace through the action of God's people when they respond to the crisis happening around the world. I read in the book saying, when we are faithful to the purpose that God made us, the image that God gave us, we will definitely do something to embrace this broken world. So when I see the churches and the organizations care for the most vulnerable people in the world and try their best to provide help and comfort to them, I can see God's hands are upon those who are in need and see God's peace in this broken world. We are living in a world torn by all types of calamities, both natural and man-made. While we were hardly recovering from COVID-19, the world is once more shaken by news of war in Ukraine, South Sudan, DR Congo, and other parts of the world. Politicians and scientists have tried their best but they have proved to be inadequate. In the midst of all those tribulations, however, our only hope of peace is in God in accordance with his promise in Matthew chapter 12, verse 26, where he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Let us rely on him. As we listen and watch the world news today, we know that COVID continues to negatively impact life for people around the world. Could it be any worse? Some of our CBM colleagues around the world consider COVID to be a rather minor problem compared to all the other pressing challenges that they're dealing with today. Now the world is facing the unimaginable situation of war in the Ukraine and its devastating results on its people. Where can we see or experience God's peace in this broken world today? Well, what is God's peace? 
Jesus in his final days of ministry on earth speaks to his disciples about what they will be experiencing after he has physically left them and encourages them, reminding them of what they need to do to experience his peace. Jesus' words is recorded in John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. God's peace isn't the same as a peaceful life. Our peace and comfort is in knowing that when we put our trust in him, he has us in his hands. All around us we see people living stressed lives, especially people who lack options, who live day to day and who are at the greatest risk when things go wrong. We see evidence of God's peace as people trust in God in the midst of their grief and loss. As communities work together to share food, supplies, and create jobs. As churches work with their communities and even other churches to find solutions to poverty and the isolation of the most vulnerable. We see evidence of God's peace as we pay attention to what he is doing and become involved in that. What opportunities might God be giving you today to do what leads to peace in your family, your work, your community? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We lived in Lebanon for nine years and the situation was not that safe there for our children to stay. So we decided to move to Ukraine and he, he, he has done so many miracles helping us to move further and saved us from that huge explosion that happened in Lebanon. And when we arrived to Ukraine, it's been like uh, two years ago, and then uh, the war started in Ukraine. So we had to flee the country. We, uh, uh, God miraculously helped us to, to, to leave the place, and we moved to the Western Ukraine, and then we had to cross the border in Romania. Stayed 63 hours in the car and uh, trying just to, to reach the border and trying to, to get to the gas station. Like God was showing miracles, like in every, every small thing. Um, we were uh, waiting and like uh, we, we didn't know if we were going to get to the first gas station as our car was out of gas. And uh, he just made people um, moving for like letting us pass and just getting forward to get to, to that gas station and then the the car broke in the middle of the night and the snow fall and we were just sitting kids crying from cold and waiting and hoping that like God will just give his miracle like just show us his hand and will lead us forward and then he sent the policeman that helped us to, to fix the car so we were able to cross the border to Romania and then here is just we were amazed with how how people were warm and welcome and provided for us like uh, there is a place here um, in the center where the ch local church organized and they helped us and um, they welcomed us in the room and my husband was not able to stay with us as he's a foreigner so uh, i had to stay here with the uh, two kids but just every day seeing that like doesn't matter what God is taking care of us. Our church uh, uh, had some damages from the air attacks. Uh, if you can pray for them, uh, they were like, they had to spread all over the world and we're just meeting online sometimes praying for each other. So if you can pray for them, because like people, um, my, I'm from Kyiv and my church was in Irpeng city. That's the place where Russians are trying to get to Kyiv through that city. So they destroyed most of the buildings, they destroyed most of the houses, hospitals, and my, my cousin is also there, so she had to live uh, with her babies underground, and uh, people in church had to, uh, they, they were providing food for whoever was able to come and live in the basement of the church. So just pray for people there, and generally for people in Ukraine, because we know that God will, will do great things um, among them, and. We're just really hoping for all of this to, to finish.
Kids, I want to speak to you for a minute, if I can, and be honest with me, okay? I know uh, for my for my children, even as they're getting older and as they're now teenagers, you know, Pam and I, we, we still ask them to do household chores, to, to help around. And you know, the, the question we get all the time is, why, Dad, why, Mom? Do I have to do this chore? Why is it so important? Why is it significant? Well, as we start to take a look at this gentleman by the name of Mark, the story that we're going to take a look at today, uh, kids, is it's a bit odd, really. Um, it's about a man. He's hurting. He can't move his legs. But he's got four friends that genuinely care about him. And you know what they do? They go up onto the roof of a house. And you have to understand something, that the houses in Jesus' time, they were flat. And what they would do is they could either cut through or open up a spot in the roof, and they lowered him down to Jesus. What? What? Why would they do this? Why? What, 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 what's going on here? Um, it seems pretty crazy to think of somebody today. I mean, you think of, uh, of friends that you have, friends that you care about and want to help. Would you have the, the courage to, to lower them through a, a roof of, an, of a neighbor's house? Uh, why? Now, I use that question, why, kids? You know, we talk about it in asking whether or not, you know, why we have to do these household chores. But kids, it also relates to how you and I think about things, things in our life, how we go about trying to help our friends to be a good neighbor, to be there for them. And that's what we're going to discover in this story today. Why would these four friends go to such great lengths? to see their friend get healed. Now, here's what I want you to be aware of, kids, as we look at this story. Not only was Jesus going to heal their friend physically, that is, they were going to see him walk again. His legs were going to work. But they were also going to do something in here. Now, why would Jesus do this? That's what I want you to talk about this week with your mom and dad. We're going to unpack the story a little bit together today, but I want you to take some time and unpack that question with your mom and dad around your dinner table. Maybe even after you've asked why I have to clean up the dishes. So friends, maybe for you, that, that question of why. You know, I posted earlier this week on social media that, you know, really, it's it's okay to go ahead and ask why. And as we begin to unpack Mark, I, I think for me, that, that's one of the discoveries that I'm finding is Mark was okay with this. He was okay with going ahead and asking why. So in asking why, Here's what I want to do to try and give us a little bit of, of first century context into um, to Mark's writings here. And I know a question, it's one we haven't really addressed at this point in our series through the Gospels is, why would we read them anyway? Why would we study uh, these men, these people, uh, you know, Matthew, Mark, a guy named Luke who was a doctor, John, he, he was a follower of Jesus, and they wrote the, the, these stories down about this, this man named Jesus that absolutely changed the world. But Chris, that was 2,000 years ago. Why are those stories still significant for me even today? 
And friends, I, I believe in the fast-paced action of, of Mark, uh, we, we, we get a glimpse into the answer to that question, why, why it is significant. Perhaps I should start uh, and maybe back up and, and take a look at some early church history to see, you know, are these stories legit? Can we really trust them? You know, oftentimes, and it's been a point of conversation in recent years, around the time of Constantine, around 324, 325 um, AD, that when Constantine legalized Christianity, that that was going to be an incredible step forward for the church. But the reality is, friends, over the last 1,700 years, church has become an institution. Church has become buildings. It's become power. It's become everything the opposite of who Jesus is and what he's calling you and I to. And we glean this from Mark. But the reason I mention those dates in our conversation today is sometimes the question gets asked, well, you really can't trust these writings because they were just pieced together from here, there, and everywhere. Now, hold on a minute. Number one, let me, let me bring in this idea of oral tradition. We need to remember that all four of these writings, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were written probably between 40 and 60 years after the actual life events of Jesus. And oral tradition was a very common thing. I mean, think about it for yourself. What events over the last 40, what significant, let me go even further, what significant events over the last 40 years of your life do you vividly remember? Do you vividly remember the Summit Series of 1972? Do you vividly remember the assassination of JFK? Do you vividly remember 9-11? And I could go on and name other significant events that are very well stored up here. Friends, that wasn't any different for the people that lived in Jesus' day. And those people that actually witnessed the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And let me just share with you just a couple of early church historians from the second century. First, Irenaeus. He says this. He says, Matthew also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect while Peter and Paul were preaching at Rome and laying the foundations of the church. After their departure, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, did also hand down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. And then also Clement of Alexandria, who lived uh, from 150 to 215 AD, he says, Mark, the follower of Peter, again, note the significance there, while Peter publicly preached the gospel at Rome before some of Caesar's equets and adduced many testimonies to Christ in order that they thereby, that they might be able to commit to memory what was spoken of what was spoken by Peter, wrote entirely what is called the gospel according to to Mark. And so you see, friends, even before the time of Constantine, when Christianity was legalized and there was a pivotal shift into this idea of Christianity and even the church as an institution, there were early historians taking account and taking a record of what these men had written down. Now, Back to Mark, that first verse, the good news. Mark jumps right in, and you might wonder, you might say, well, wait a second, why doesn't he, like Matthew, like Luke, record some of the earlier life events of, of Jesus, like the significance of his birth? Well, very simply, I think Mark, he's a, he's a person of action. He jumps right in to what is going on. It's interesting to note, and I want to reference um, N.T. Wright. He was posed, he was asked the question, um, what, what the Bible, the significance of those writings, 
what would they be like if we didn't have the writings of Mark? And I so appreciate N.T. Wright's response. He says we would lose the sense of urgency, the sense of urgency to what Jesus was looking to accomplish. And Mark, the focal point for, for Mark is his death. Could there truly be good news in the death of Jesus? I want to reference another scholar, Dr. R. Allen Cole, because, again, one, one of the, the conversations, maybe even if I could say this this way, maybe it's a little bit stronger language, but the argument that sometimes comes up is, well, you know, over the centuries, these writings, they've been misinterpreted, they've been misunderstood, and you know something? I would absolutely agree. Because we're human. And when we look to glean from these stories, what is the significant and a significant piece? And I appreciate these words of Dr. Cole. He says, any new or startling interpretation of God's word is by that very fact unlikely to be right. Now catch this. Sheer humility teaches us that. And all wise people strive to heed it. So, I think what Dr. Cole is referencing here is we really genuinely need to go back to the source. What is Mark after? And again, if I could for just a moment, Scripture is given so that you and I can live from it. Those are the words of N.T. Wright. Let me say that again. Scripture is given so that you and I can live from it. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Powerful thought. Powerful thought. And that leads us to jumping into the action of Mark. I'm not going to take a lot of time today to unpack this story. It's found in, in Mark 2. I talked a little bit about it already with the kids today. Uh, but the healing of, of this paralyzed man. But there's a couple of things I, I want to I pull away from this story. There's two things that happen here. Two healings, to be exact. One is physical, one is spiritual. I already mentioned the physical one uh, in talking with the kids, and you can find it in the first few verses of Mark chapter 2. Feel free, read it, feel free to read it for yourself. Um, his, the, the faith of his friends, uh, they really believed that Jesus can do this. They'd already been seeing some healings. In fact, Mark records some even in, in the first chapter. And so they come, they lower him down, Jesus heals him, he makes him physically well. But, but here's what I want you to understand. Even before he does this, he forgives this man's sins. And that's significant for a couple of reasons. One, because of a group of religious people that were gathered there in that place, they were like, wait a second, you can't do that. You can't do that, Jesus. Only God can do that. But what was Jesus doing here? He was asserting his authority as God. And the Pharisees didn't know what to do with that. So what did they do eventually? Well, we just came through it on the Easter story, didn't we? They sentenced him to death, but death couldn't even hold him. So we see the heart of the Pharisees come through as they wrestle with the authority of Jesus. But Jesus raises a question in the midst of this. He says, is it easier to forgive a person's sins or is it easier to heal them, physically speaking? Now, as we see from Mark's story, Jesus does both. But here's where I want you and I to wrestle this week, for you and I. As we look at the, the pain, uh, the suffering in our world, people that are hurting physically, dealing with struggles. I want to ask you and I today the same question that Jesus asked those religious leaders. 
Is it easier to forgive them in here, to forgive the heart condition, or is it easier for you and I to heal their physical condition? Can you and I genuinely forgive? Can you and I genuinely love people when we've been wronged? And you see, this was what's, this was so revolutionary for these people. And the, the people speak about it. They speak about how, how come he speaks with such authority? How come he speaks with such excitement? How can he be so bold? It's because Jesus had come, yes, to bring physical healing and life, but even more than that, to begin life anew in here. That's what's so incredible. I want to leave you with um, the lyrics to a song by you too. You might be familiar with it. Uh, the song is simply called, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. In there, in a part of the lyrics, they say, I believe in the kingdom come. Then all the colors will bleed into one. But yes, I'm still running. You broke the bonds and you loose the chains, carried the cross of my shame. You know I believe it, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Now, I don't want to try and interpret what you two, what their meaning of this song is. I just want to share with you what I take away from those lyrics and what I see when I read them, when I hear them, when I sing them. Is that in my human condition, what I'm looking for is physical healing to be, if I could use this as an example, to be well on the outside. That's what the people in Jesus' day were looking for, to be well again, to be made whole on the outside, the outer appearance. But Jesus was going to offer them something more, healing in here. But even Jesus' closest followers, and Mark will unpack this just as we have seen in Matthew's writings, even his closest followers didn't get this until after he physically died and rose again. Friends, that's the good news that we know that we still have some 2,000 years later. Knowing these, knowing these stories, knowing these actual events, that's the good news in death. Is that death is not, as I said last week, death is not final. And so when you sit down at your table this week, and the kids are doing their chores and they ask why, and maybe you're asking why about something that, that's happened at work, a, a situation uh, with a coworker, maybe there's a, an illness in your family, and the only word that you can mutter is why, go ahead and ask Jesus. Because just like we see with this paralyzed man, Jesus will forgive. Jesus will renew and restore this in here. And as he restores this, you and I can live in that wonderful, wonderful hope. So go with him, friends, because he's already where you are going. I believe in the sun
Because he 